Good morning. <coughs> Good morning. Yeah, Jung Chiu Jie Kuai Le. Jung Chiu Jie Kuai Le. Okay, what does that mean? Testing, testing. Happy Mid Autumn Festival, everybody. You mean you were not out nibbling mooncakes, moon looking at the moonlight last night? I wasn't either. I got the invite from my neighbor. Too late. So. Uh, Afford the calories. Okay. Yeah, mooncakes. They're high. I mean, really, really pleasant that they finally came out with the mini mooncakes. Have you noticed that? That, that? You know, instead of like these dry. Do you guys know what a mooncake is? It's like a fig newton on steroids. <laughs> so, but yeah, well, welcome. My name is Jennifer Turner, and uh, I direct the China Environment Forum here. And I know not all of you are from my China mafia, which is good. I'm glad. Um, yes, um, I'm really happy to welcome you to this China Environment Forum meeting here at the good old Woodrow Wilson Center. China Environment Forum has uh, been hanging our hat here for 13 years, and I've been here 11, bringing together government, NGO, business, and researchers from around the world to focus on China's energy and environmental challenges. And in the past year, we've had, we got great support from the Blue Moon Fund, Rockefeller Brother Fund, and Vermont Law School and USAID to do a project called Cooperative Competitors, Building New Energy and Climate Networks, Building New U.S.-China Energy and Climate Networks, important piece missing there. And um, we've uh, had a, a really busy year because it, it, it's, it's a relatively hot topic, um, getting hotter at every moment. And... Uh, so we've been doing a lot on the solar and going to do CCS and all this stuff. But in my heart, I've really been obsessed with the idea of, of the water energy nexus in China and the U.S. And then, well, my good buddy here, Carl, from Circle of Blue, uh, kind of answered my, my prayers here to kind of how, how do I really attack this issue. It's a big topic. Um, today we actually we have Carl Ganter and Keith Schneider from Circle of Blue. It's a global news and science organization. They'll tell you more about what they do. And they're going to talk about the results of their choke point. Well, it's ever evolving. It's not like it doesn't end. They haven't, they haven't figured it out totally yet. But Choke Point U.S., which is a penetrating exploration of the fierce contest between the nation's growing demand for energy and the tightening supplies of fresh water. And they are joined by Jeffrey Fulgham who's the Chief Sustainability Officer and Eco-Imagination Leader at General Electric, who's going to bring in an invaluable wealth of experience because he works on global water issues for his company. And he's on the three-year plan with me. Three years almost to the day. He gave a presentation here. We did, the, we did the first Green Olympic meeting in D.C. You know, research centers were all up on being cutting edge. But, yeah, that was a very fun meeting where we had videos of Yao Ming stopping bullets and whatnot. So there's <laughs> – so no cameos by Yao Ming today. No. Nope. But – I think it will be exciting. Yes? They've promised me. Yes, absolutely. Even though Carl's barely conscious, um, he just came back from China. But yeah, so um, uh, you have their... Today's meeting, though, and I'll stop shortly. I'm just giving Carl a few moments to get that caffeine into his system here. Um, today's meeting is a bit unusual for me because you, if you notice, the word China was not in the title, right? <laughs> and you're reading, reading, reading at the very end, say, well, some, some implications for China. Well, that's because today, um, you know, as part of our, our cooperative competitors, where we want to look at U.S.-China water energy nexus. You know, today we're starting with the U.S. And uh, Circle of Blue and my shop, we're working to actually start a choke point China project. It's kind of in the works. Um, so, um, and, uh, you know, so today you're going to start on the U.S. side and stay tuned. And those of you who are, are new to my network or the Wilson Center, make sure you throw your card at me or Assistant Pete. Raise your hand, Pete, so we can get you onto our mafia list. You have the bios that say wonderful things about these men. They are all wonderful. And they can put sentences together quite well, too. Um, Carl is the co-founder and director of Circle of Blue. He's an award-winning photojournalist, writer, broadcast reporter, and master pun maker. So be ready to ground shortly. He gallivants around the world. All those hoity-toity meetings, right? Clinton Global Initiative and World Economic Forum. And he comes back home occasionally to the Wilson Center. Um, you've been here I don't even know how many times. Twice for me, we've done a um, Circle of Blue and China Environment Forum have done two multimedia stories on water issues in China. You can check it out on their website or my website. We also have Keith Schneider, who I met with the first one. He's a better editor than I am, too, I found out. Um, he's senior editor at Circle of Blue, and he manages the news desk, participates in multimedia story development, reporting, editing, and all that great stuff. He was a New York Times national correspondent for over a decade, and I'm honored. <laughs> well, he, does, he does great stuff. And then, last but not least, again, more details on the sheets of paper you have. There's Jeff Fulgham, and he, um, I think you do more than your bio states, was my guess. But it, it says you're responsible for, for the global strategic marketing initiatives on existing, and, on existing and emerging markets and lead the business intelligence, regional segmentation, and commercial training functions for his business. 
those are words I don't usually string together. But I'm going to stop now because I think you've all gathered caffeine in your hands, ready to go. And um, I think, Carl, you're going to kick it off for us. And um, thank you all for coming. And they have succinct presentations. And you must think of riveting, difficult questions for them shortly. OK? I'll take this guy. Great. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And the coffee is starting to kick in for everybody, I hope. Um, and will those, will those be croissant moon cakes? Oh, no. <laughs> Um, our, anyway, our, so I do want to thank everybody for coming and the Wilson Center and the Environmental Change Security Program oh, yes. and the China Environment Forum and Peter and Jennifer and uh, everybody. Um, it's been eight years since I was vacuumed into this, this family here when we started something called Navigating Peace at uh, the Environmental Change Security Program where we looked at environmental issues and the intersections between water and foreign policy and security and all those other fun things in China in Mexico and in Africa, I believe. Um, so I was on the Mexico team. And that was really eye-opening because we saw this big intersection between, I'm a journalist, and so I tell stories. That's what Keith does. And then through the Wilson Center, we saw all these connections between data. So journalism then becomes data. Then journalism becomes science. How do you make sense of the data? And then the science, how do you make sense of the science? Because scientists aren't necessarily great storytellers. So then we circle back. And then we add on top of this um, the convening part. So how do you bring people together to actually look for and analyze this knowledge, this data, the, the narrative storytelling, and how do you find the trends? How do you spot the trends? Take a step back, as our friend Jerry Leninger, the astronaut, um, <laughs> would say, let's go orbital. Um, we were actually had a conference call the other day, and uh, Jennifer was on it, and uh, Jerry stopped by our office, and he was, I said, I said Jennifer, we have a guest in the, in the office here. Jerry, tell Jennifer your experience with China. And so Jerry said, well, looking down on China, Jennifer didn't know he was an astronaut. Oh so Jerry's talking about, he's saying, looking down on China, I could see the dust clouds going across from Beijing all the way to LA. And I could see, I could see the Great Wall. And Jennifer's like, what? What's this about? <laughs> How many times have you been to China? And Jerry said, oh, over a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> so he was going orbital, that's for sure. So I'll slide over here and uh, just talk a little bit about um, you know, how, how we work, uh, what we're finding around the world, and then we'll move into talking about this, this nexus of, uh, of energy and water. Um, so what I want to do is just take a quick look at what we're finding in different parts of the globe. Now at Circle of Blue we use, I like to say the superheroes. Superheroes in journalism, science, design, data. Um, in fact, I'll show you some cool new data tools today that are just available online today from our friends at Google Labs. So a couple little treats we've got. Um, uh, on the deck here. But anyway, so what's happening around the world with water? Now, many of you, I, I would guess, how many people do work in water here? Okay. Actually, everybody should probably raise their hand because it intersects everything we, we care about. And I'll show you a little bit about uh, that wh and why. Um, but in the Tehuacan Valley of Mexico, this is Francisca Rosa Valencia. And when we sent a team to Tehuacan, we, we looked at water from a, a big perspective. We looked at it from the farming perspective, from the development perspective, the economics, all these other ish issues, the climate change issues. And then we interviewed Francisca. And when we talked to Francisca, we let her talk, we let her talk, and then finally we asked her a big question. How does water intersect or how does it affect you and your family? And we let the cameras roll. It was silent. And it was silent. And then she started to cry because her family was leaving. Her children were leaving because there wasn't enough water. They couldn't grow corn. There wasn't a future for them there. They were moving to the megacities. They were moving to Mexico City. And then they were coming north. And it wasn't for managed health care in the US. So, so it was an immigration issue. So a lot of kind of, we call them dope slap issues. If you just take that little step back a little bit, and you'll find that water is an immigration issue, even with our neighbors. We hear about water being an immigration issue in Bangladesh and other countries, but right across our border, border water is an immigration issue. We found these farmers, it's also a pricing issue. This is the first time, an economic issue, first time these farmers ever had to pay for water because their wells are running dry. We also found some hope because in an ancient grain called amaranth. So in certain parts of the world, we're going to have to be making some major shifts in how we grow our food. And they're starting to do that in the Tehuacan Valley. They're starting to switch from corn, from maize, 
It's the region where corn was domesticated. They're starting to switch to another grain, amaranth, which is much hardier. In Australia, this is uh, Gilbert Bain. Uh, we tracked him down, saw him in the, in the dusty distance, tracked him down and said, Gilbert, I, I literally flagged him down, climbed up on the, on the combine, said, hi, I'm from, I'm from Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and said, tell me, you know, what's going on here? And he, they had just planted wheat in dried up rice paddies. And the wheat was only this tall. He was basically combining dust, okay? This is what it looked like from the air. This is the Murray-Darling Basin, which is drying up. They got a little rain recently, but it's still, they're doing one of the largest plumbing projects ever on the planet. And the Australian government is buying up water rights. So this is a huge story unfolding in the developed world in Australia. And it rippled throughout entire food markets. It rippled throughout the entire rice industry. The rice industry is 3% what it used to be. So it's pretty remarkable. I mean, this, for journalists, this is a story. But it's a dramatic story. And it's a tragic story. So we're also finding Inner Mongolia. So back to what Jerry was talking about, this is the dust that Jerry was seeing from space that blows to Beijing and blows to LA. And then with, with Jennifer's crew, we looked at the Yunnan province in China. We looked at a karst region. Karst is a porous limestone. We looked at kind of the, the it's a, a tragedy, it's an intersection between poor land management and poor geology. And so what happens is you have this hard sponge. It rains. The water goes th right through the soil because the soil's eroded. It literally is washing the soil 1,000 to 1,500 feet underground. In fact, Chris Groves, a, a scientist who is with us, a karst expert, said, don't back up, don't back up any further because you'll fall, fall down a hole. And then he got this glow in his eyes, and he picked up, scientists are great, got this glow in his eyes, picked up a big rock, and threw it into this clump of bushes. And we listened, and we listened, and Aaron, who's here, was holding a big microphone, and we listened, and finally we heard that rock hit. That hole was as deep as the Washington Monument is tall, right in the middle of his farm field. In fact, the little tree right here you see is one of those trees. If I'd stepped back about three or four more feet, I would have, I would have been standing in line at the Washington Monument. Um, so, looking up. Um, anyway, and then the top of the world. We've probably all heard the, the story of the Himalayan glaciers and talking about who's downstream. Talk about geopolitical issues, who's downstream. Talk about environmental issues, cultural issues. When we did a big piece, one of the early big pieces on the Himalayas and the challenges there, we got pushback from some, some scientists in India. When we finally tracked them down, Peter Glick, our uh, water expert you're probably familiar with at the Pacific Institute, who we work with, Peter called and said, what in the world have you done? You've really kind of poked the issue here, looking at the Himalayas and the melting, and the melting glaciers and asserting that some of these rivers could potentially go dry. The pushback wasn't on the science. It was on the culture side, because how can a holy river go dry? A holy river can't go dry. So in India, we have another big story that we're working on, and this is something that, that will be ongoing, but is the whole megacities, the whole urbanization here. So how do you bring water to people like Francisca Rosa Valencia's sons who moved to Mexico City and live in East of Palapa in the, in the barrios? Because their water comes from a little, little black tube, and it's not safe to drink, and it only flows for maybe an hour a week that they get to fill up their, their tubs. So... India, of course, another hotspot, Punjab, the whole, the whole breadbasket challenge. And then the sewers, the infrastructure, these are the Victoria. We, we even go into the sewers um, for you. <laughs> I mean, water, the other half of that, we won't talk a lot about that today, but the other half of that, of course, is sanitation. Huge, huge issue of sanitation. We can't ignore it. But what we did is we sent a photographer into the, into the Victorian sewers to see, see what those are like. At the same time, while well, London is rebuilding its whole sewer infrastructure system. And of course, the All-American Canal, the U.S., this is just an example, the U.S. faces some huge, huge water challenges. The GAO says 39 states will face water scarcity within the next three to five years. I think we, we all live at least close to one of those states. Um, so pretty remarkable things that are unfolding here. This is a huge, from our perspective, huge story. Um, so... To inform that story, again, some other pieces that we've done, we commissioned a big survey last fall, GlobeScan survey, to look at what people believed were the number one priorities or the top priorities 
of environment around the world. And we polled in 15 countries, and we found, this is right before Copenhagen, we found that water scarcity and water pollution are number one and number two. Climate change is number six. Okay. So when you talk about climate change, there's a better narrative with water. It's how, it walks, it's how climate walks up to our front door. And so this is another example of the data piece. So we used a, a tool called Fusion Tables from Google to suck in all of our, uh, all of our polling data. And then we put this into a, a very cool dashboard so you can actually do comparisons between the different countries and uh, compare GDP, compare sanitation, compare water access. As part of that polling, there are people like Norm Nivers, who lives on the Salton Sea. And Norm, when we photographed him, um, Brent Sturton from Getty Images said, you know, I was there and, and Norm, Norm was waiting for his five o'clock martini. And he was waiting for the water to come back. So um, I guess that would be a really dry martini. Um, <laughs> I warned you. <laughs> Sorry, I had to live up to it at least a little bit. So I talk about the data tools. Um, today, uh, Fusion Tables from Google has, we add some new, f some new features. And I would encourage you to look up Fusion Tables because UN Habitat and some others are starting to use this tool. Through the Wilson Center, through Navigating Peace, we saw all these different data sets coming in, different organizations that come present to us, and the data would be in different formats. How could we collaborate? How could we suck this in? And so I went to Google and said, hey, we, we need to do this. We had a range of people on the phone. Somebody from the State Department said, that's a lot of data we can send you. And the response on the other end of the line was, we're Google. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> send us everything you've got. And so two years later, they came up with something called Fusion Tables, which is an easy way, relatively easy way, or if you have lots of interns, even easier, to suck in lots of data <laughs> and start to visualize it and push it through to mapping to all sorts of cool things. So we used Fusion Tables on the pre for, to produce the previous, called a ClickView dashboard. This is live today on our site. It's, uh, it's Fusion Tables with some new features. You see that now we can drill down, so to speak, to the county level. So with Fusion Tables on, into Fusion Mapper, we can actually do polygons and start to map out specific regions. And these are tools for the rest of us. I mean, you could probably do this over a matter of weeks, or you can do it over a matter of hours um, with Fusion Tables. So Google Labs, um, you can learn a lot more about it. And so, for example, for Choke Point US on the energy side, we were curious where all the power plants were, the thermoelectric power plants were. So we pulled, we pulled in all the, the GPS points, I think, um, on these power plants, although a couple of them are, are located somewhere in the middle of Lake Michigan, so I won't show you this, so we have to figure out whose GPS points were wrong. Um, but here's what it looks like, so that we can zoom in, and this is water, this is water use, right here, on the, on the red here, and so this is just, just live today, and we can zoom in here even more and take a look at Kern County, and we can look at the actual the withdrawal, thermal, mining, so we can actually start to break this down. And we're adding a lot more data every day to these pieces. So very, very cool ways of starting to do some comparative analysis of how this water is used and where our choke points might exist. And then also we put in all the, all the, uh, the PowerPoint, or the PowerPoint, the power plant uh, data. So pretty cool stuff that we can start to really look at these trends, start to do the trend spotting, go a little orbital on these big issues and start to see the intersections. So when we talk about intersections, when I ask people to raise their hand, um, we did a sustainability, we published a sustainability globe scan survey last spring. Um, and their, this is, this is their, you know, this is their finding. All sectors of the economy will need to transform over the next decade, that's the next 10 years, that's not a lot of time, um, as the result of water shortages. And this is the, in the United States. And so here are those sectors. Anybody know anybody in these sectors? It's not just the beverage companies, it's not just the mining companies, it's food and agriculture, pulp, paper, beverage, mining, manufacturing, chemicals, electric, oil, all the way to apparel, stonewashed jeans, you can imagine that. Tehuacan is actually a big stonewashed jeans capital and it's water scarce. All the way down, pharmaceutical, healthcare, automotive. So all these pieces, the entire industrial sector will be affected or is already affected by this choke point. 
so to speak, by the choke point. So anyway, so we wanted to take a look at, as journalists, we, we can't do everything. Um, well, we can, try. we can try. So we wanted to take a look at what this choke point means, what this intersection means between water and energy. We like to ask really simple questions. What happens when you mix water with energy? Well, it goes two ways, okay? It takes a lot of water to generate energy, a lot of water to extract energy, and it takes a lot of energy to move and treat water. So with that, I wanted to um, hand off to Keith to talk about, Keith's our senior editor, um, who's led the reporting on Choke Point US to talk about um, your, oh, your notes are here. Um, are you switching out? I'm sorry, Keith, your, your presentation's on here, it's so on you're all set. Okay. You're yep. all set. Yep. <laughs> We're full service here. Yep. So here you go. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. How are you? In a journalist career, and I've been a journalist now most of my life, unfortunately, um, you have about three or four <gasps> times in your career where you have a big story, a story that can change how people think, how, how nations react to critical issues. And in starting this project with Carl and our team, by the way, I wanted to introduce Molly Walton and Aaron Jaffe here in the middle. Can you raise your hand? Two of our young reporter researchers who were vital to putting what I'm about to tell you together. Um, we, I came to Carl and said, you know, we really need to look at what I think is the two most important environmental stories and likely the two most important geopolitical and economic stories, and that is energy and water consumption, particularly in the area of climate change. What's happening where rising energy demand is confronting and colliding with diminishing fresh water supplies? And he said, great, let's do it. And we were seeking to only answer one simple question. In the United States, will the transition to clean energy produce a dividend for water? That is, will we use less or will it be a water penalty? Will we use more? Well, that an that qu the answer to that question came pretty quickly. Unless we're really, really careful in the United States, really careful, the transition to the clean energy economy will exacerbate water scarcity. Only two of the clean energy technologies now available in the United States, solar PV, solar po photovoltaic, or and wind, use less water than the current energy produ production process. Every other technology particularly biofuels, anything that has to do with agriculture, will increase water consumption to, depending upon whether it's irrigated, to a thousand times more water will be used. So in the Midwest, where we come from, where Michigan State University agronomists are, you know, literally telling us they can produce in the Midwest the Saudi Arabia biofuels, it's a pipe dream. It really is a pipe dream. It ain't going to happen. And it won't happen principally because we need the food on that ground but it also won't happen because there's impediment in the use of water. And even in that region, out in, in the aquifers in that region, we're having diminishing supplies of fresh water. Um, what we found beyond answering that question is that the United States is heading into, as we know, not only to economic turbulence, not only to resource tur turbulence, not only into social turbulence in this century, we are heading into a collision between energy and water that we need to solve. Can be solved, but it will, it will, re, it will require uh, levels of intelligence and courage and change and transition and alteration you know, that's going to be a magnitude different than what we're doing now. Jeff, I think, can speak a little to that, but that's what we found. We found that, we found that if, in fact, we are going to meet energy demand in the United States, 40% increase in energy demand, which the DOE is projecting by 2050. We're going to grow 100 million people by the middle of the century. If, in fact, we're going to meet that energy demand of 40% increase, we're either going to need to really significantly change how we produce energy in this country, or we will wreck the country. We will produce more um, national sacrifice zones. And forgive me for anybody here is from West Virginia. But we will produce more sacrifice zones like the Gulf or West Virginia in the places that we least expect them, the northern Great Plains, the far west, the deep south, the northeast. If we pursue energy the way we did it in the 20th century, we will wreck the country and we will significantly uh, decrease, mar our freshwater resources. So let me go through some of this stuff. 
shift? No, nope, just the arrow key on the right. This one? All right, let me tell you a little a sort of an emblematic story about what's happening out there. This involves solar generating power. In 2009, the United States passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. It has, give or take, 80 to $100 billion for clean energy investment. A lot of it's going into solar. So in 2009, late in 2009, the Department of Interior, Ken Salazar, announced that he was going to release or make available or it had to identify 23 million acres in the southwest in six states for solar energy development. How do I go back? This one? Um, that announcement, coupled with the billions that are available to solar energy developments, prompted developers to submit to states and the federal government 180 proposals to, to develop 53 gigawatts of solar power in the American southwest. Um, and everybody was moving down that track in the, in, the, in the government. And then John Jarvis, who was then the Pacific West uh, director of the National Park Service, who's now the director of the Park Service, sent a memo into his agency, to his friends at the BLM. And he said, you know, if you do this, the consequences to the Park Service lands out there, to the biota, to the ecological you know, conditions, will diminish significantly. Because those 53 gigawatts of electricity, if they're conventionally cool, the way we cool coal fire plants, which is to run a lot of water through them and up the stack, um, you know, is going to take 164 billion gallons of water in the driest part of the country. And John Kyle, very quickly after that, did a, John Kyle, the Republican senator from Arizona, suddenly became an environmentalist, and um, noted in a report that this just can't happen. This collision between energy supply, energy demand in the southwest involving solar power can't happen in that region without seriously diminishing the water supplies for cities and for agriculture. Um, the Department of Interior has kind of begun to look at that, has put, put together some in environmental impact statements, and there is a move in the southwest, particularly in California, to change the cooling technology to air-cooled technology. But there's a rub there as well, and in each of these there's a very significant rub. In order to do air-cooled technology in the desert, it's very inefficient. You know, you're cooling it from <laughs> 150 to 130 degrees. You lose a lot of efficiencies in your cooling, which means that your plants have to be much bigger. So the Sierra Club and its colleagues are very concerned about how much ground in the, in the, in the uh, sensitive deserts these solar plants are going to take. Now, solar is now generating about 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 gig, uh, megawatts of electricity, which is like two 500 megawatt power plants. I mean, it's a, it's a tiny bit. And even if we you know, develop 53 gigawatts, which is proposing, that's still a tiny amount of energy in a country which is using 1,000 gigawatts of electricity right now. So the solar power story is troublesome at best in the places where it works the best. Let me tell you about some of the important um, numbers that we have to talk about. There's some, like, what I call fun numbers, fun facts. And there's, there's a few of them. One of them is this. The United States, according to USGS, uses 400, withdraws from lakes, rivers, streams, and a little bit from the sea, 410 billion gallons of water a day to do what it does. Ha it, it is producing um, about half of this water, 210 billion gallons, is used to cool power plants. Most of them coal plants, some of them thermoelectric plants, a few of them biomass plants. Half of the water that was drawn from our rivers, lakes, streams, a little bit from the sea, is used to coal, coal, cool power plants. And it's designed, of course, to meet this very important nexus. Energy demand and water supply and the two resources are inextricably, inextricably linked and will be so for as far as we can see. Another fun fact is this one, 200 billion gallons a day. That goes principally into coal. And if you look at it, it, me it represents this. If you do 200 billion times 365 days a year, you're generating, you're using, withdrawing from the nation water, 55 to 75 trillion gallons a year, which is essentially what flows over Niagara Falls in five months. It's a lot of water, a lot of water. Here's, here's another fun fact. The Department of Energy says that we need to meet our current demands, the way we live today, 40% more energy by 2050. But as I said, 
if we pursue this, this power, this energy demand, using this principle of the 20th century, production first, we will produce significant visible damage in almost every region of the country. <laughs> significant visible damage. If we think that the Gulf Coast BP catastrophe was bad, we'll see it as we go on. What are we going to do about it? Well, what we learned in this, pro in this project is that the United States government really doesn't want to know. We discovered that the Department of Energy, which initiated some of the early consideration in 2005 and 2006, prompted by a congressional act in the Energy Security Act of 2005, and asked for a study that looks at this nexus between energy demand and water supply, and produced a really nice set of, 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 of documents and, and data, some of which we're discussing here. Then they asked them, okay, we need the second report. What do we do about it? What are the research choke points that we need to understand so that we're, if we need power in Wyoming, are we building a coal-fired power plant there? Are we biofuels? What are we doing? Solar? Well, that report was finished by its authors. There are about five co-authors, most of them San Diego National Laboratories. It was finished in the summer of 2006. It's been through 22 rewrites. The last rewrite, the 22nd rewrite, went into the Department of Energy in May of 2009, and nobody's heard a word about this thing since. And this roadmap study is essential, essential to, to helping lawmakers understand where we need to, where we need to grapple most uh, significantly with how we will power the country. And this is very significant in terms of climate change, because the, the the areas where energy demand is rising fastest, California, the Southwest, the Rocky Mountain West, and the Southeast, are also the areas where water scarcity is increasing the fastest, where diminished moisture content in rivers and lakes, principally through snowmelt and rain, is decreasing the fastest. So if we're using half of the water withdrawn in the United States for cooling power plants and 8 billion gallons a year to run these plants, 8 billion gallons a day, to run these plants, where's that water going to come from if in the fastest rising, the fastest growing areas? Let me go through some of these findings. Talked a little bit about biofuels. This is a picture that Carl took of a biofuels and ethanol plant in, in Indiana? Illinois. Illinois. For sure. Look, guys, biofuels is not going to be the deal if we're worried about water. It might be good for farmers. It's been very good for farmers certainly good for communities, might be good for the refining industry, but in terms of water use, it is a mess. It is a very significant problem. And scientists are telling us that there's not a lot that we can do about this because of how, again, the production first principle is at work in the United States. Now, the agronomists and the farmers will say, we'll grow the switchgrass on the least in the marginal lands and not irrigate it. Well, if, if if we're producing ethanol and it's selling or meth you know, anything that has to do with biofuels and it's selling for three, four dollars a gallon, they're going to irrigate it. And there are very significant questions about the contest between water, biofuels, and food production. Here's a really interesting one. This is Lake Mead. This is an amazing choke point. The Colorado River is now running at levels 30 to 40 percent in terms of moisture, in terms of water in the river than it uh, did 10 years ago. The drought on the Colorado Plateau is now 10 or 11 years old. Lake Mead is 41% full. That means it's 59% empty. Its lake levels have fallen 135 feet since 1999 when it was last full. The Bureau of Reclamation has anticipated this problem and has reduced the power generating capacity of the Hoover Dam 33% in that time. But the lake levels are falling far enough that if it falls another 25 feet, check this out, if it falls another 25 feet, they're going to have to turn off these generators. There isn't going to be enough water in the Lake Mead to run those generators. It's one of the biggest power plants out west. It's 2,000 plus megawatts. If that occurs, the power cost, the cost of electricity in the many of the cities that gain most of their power or a very large portion of their power from this power plant, their costs are going to rise significantly very significantly. And it's emblematic of what of this significant choke point between energy demand and water supply. Here's another one. We discovered in this in this reporting a huge story that's hardly unreported in the United States, which is called 
unconventional fuels development. Conventional fossil fuels, particularly transportation fuels, oil and gas, comes from pools deep underground, like the BP pool, the whatever, Montcalm, that Montcalm pool. You drill down, it's a straw, and you pull up liquid, liquid oil, and you pull up gas. Those are called conventional reserves. And the world has used about a trillion barrels of oil, and we use 20 million, roughly, maybe a little less now, 18 million barrels a day, 7 billion barrels a year. And we use trillions and trillions of, of feet of natural gas. Well, the oil industry has been working overtime and spending a fortune, much more money than is going into clean energy development today, to develop what is called unconventional fuels. And unconventional fuels is essentially mining. The industry is becoming a mining industry. And they are drilling down into these deep, carbon-rich reserves of shale, two miles deep, all over the country, and then horizontally drilling, and then putting into these wells at 8,200 pounds per square inch at the surface. So when it falls two miles, who knows what that, and fracturing, fracking these shales in order to provide spaces in the rock through which natural gas and oil can flow. 56% of the nation's natural gas is now coming from unconventional fuel reserves, unconventional gas reserves. This is a well down the, down the road from where I live in northern Michigan. Um, each of those wells, in order to fracture them, requires three to seven million gallons of water. And that water is coming to these wells in large parts on trucks. So in order to do, these, do this production, it takes hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of back and forth trips in trucks. And if you see one of these well sites um, in the fracking process, it looks like a military encampment. Dozens and dozens of heavy trucks and pumps pumping this stuff down. And it's a dangerous thing. It's, it, 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 it's, oh, sorry. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? It's, it, it, it's risky, very risky enterprise. In the Northern Great Plains is now becoming a major oil production center in the United States. This is a well in North Dakota. North Dakota is now the fourth largest oil production state in the, in the United States. It is producing 100 million barrels of oil a, day, a, a year, 300 plus thousand barrels a day. Its production is going up 10 to 20 percent. The industry is spending $7 billion a year to drill 1,000 wells a year. These wells are being drilled into a formation called the Bakken Shale. The western shales, oil shales, were largely seen as a potential source. The Department of Energy says in the western shales there are, quote, hundreds of billions of barrels of recoverable oil. Now, we're using 20 billion a year, so hundreds of billions. We have enough oil, trillions of barrels of oil in these shales, but it's been very difficult to tap them because they're, the shales that we've been looking at in Colorado and Wyoming and Utah are these kind of friable rocks. They're close to the surface, and the, you know, Shell and others can't figure out how to you know, drain the oil from it, process it in a way that gets enough oil that makes the, makes the cash flow. Well, in North Dakota, the oil industry found another shale reserve called the Bakken Shale, and they can fracture these, these wells drill down two miles, horizontally drill, fracture that rock, and split the rock sufficiently, pulverize it sufficiently that oil will, liquid oil will actually drain out of it. And North Dakota's um, becoming, North Dakota, Montana, Saskatchewan, are becoming a major oil center. At, at the current rate of production, North Dakota could become the second largest oil producer in the country behind Alaska, very quickly, <laughs> like within four or five years of current rates of production. And the oil industry is so enthused about this, and the communities are so enthused about this, and the states are so, th so enthused about this, that the industry is spending tens of millions of dollars today to lease ground, lease minerals on both public and private lands in Wyoming and Colorado to pursue another similar oil shale reserve called the Neobrara Reserve. And if it produces like this produces, that area becomes a major oil production center. Each of those wells also take three to seven million gallons of water to fracture the wells in one of the driest parts of the country. And it is starting to produce civic unrest in, among the farm community, among the rural community, and among the municipal water suppliers because with the exception of a very large lake behind Help me, anybody here from North Dakota? I think a, a dam, Griffin Dam, is that it? Very large 
core dam that was built in the 40s, there isn't a lot of surface water there. And there's unrest and discontent among the environmental stewards in neighboring states about how much water is going to come out of the Missouri River to do this, to do this um, production. But if you look at the tilt between the energy industry's influence politically and the agriculture industry's influence politically and everybody else, they're going to go after this oil. And the reason they're going to go after this oil because North Dakota's unemployment rate is 3.6 percent, the lowest in the country. And in June, their budget director reported an $800 million surplus. So their whole scene is a whole lot different than what's going on. Here's another unconventional reserve. You've heard a lot about this, tar sands development. This is in northern Alberta. The oil industry is spending $15 billion a year to turn, to turn bitumen-rich soaked sands into oil. And they are busy turning the landscape, a, a South Carolina, North Carolina-sized land, landscape, drained and fed by the Athabasca River, into, you know, a sacrifice zone. I mean, that's the only way we can say it. It's a, it's a very highly industrial, highly polluting. It is the largest now, largest source of CO2 emissions in Canada. Um, the Americans, Chinese, Canadians, and European oil companies are in there turning this reserve. 1.1 million of the 1.3 million barrels of oil produced there every day comes to the United States. And it's coming to the United States so that refineries in the Great Lakes, in Illinois, Oklahoma, and the Gulf Coast can take it and process it. And so the industry is spending at least $20 billion right now to modernize and expand oil refineries in the United States. This one here is in Detroit. It's the Marathon Refinery undergoing a $2.1 billion modernization and equipment change because in order to process that oil, it takes a different kinds of, of uh, technology and chemistry to do that in heating. The other piece of this, which is important to Washington, is that the, is that the pipeline industry is spending $30 billion on pipelines, massive new pipeline infrastructure coming down from tar sands through the Dakotas, down the middle of the country, into the Great Lakes, to move tar sands oil into the United States, all the way south to the Gulf. One of those pipelines, one of the older pipelines, ruptured in Michigan in July and produced the largest oil spill in the history of the Midwest. A million, million gallons of oil flowed into the Kalamazoo River. Um, so we're not clear yet about whether there's a, a pipeline corrosion issue with this oil or, or whether that's just the industry. But the industry, the pipeline industry is having problems through the country moving this oil. Not huge problems, Gulf Coast problems, but significant problems. And that, that, that um, a pipeline rupture in Michigan was significant because those pipelines are now in play in Washington because the EPA and the State Department are in confrontation over the Keystone XL pipeline, which is the $6 billion, 1,200, 1,800-mile network to feed tar sands oil through the middle of the country. EPA says that the State Department didn't do a good enough job in reviewing the environment. Now note, the earlier pipeline, the Keystone pipeline, which is of similar magnitude, which was moved through the process during the Bush administration, just flowed right through. So a lot of this development happened during the Bush administration, largely out of public view and out of public reporting, except in the Great Plains where it's causing, you know, significant civic unrest. Let me tell you one story about what's happening in Montana and, and Idaho over this. In order to develop the tar sands, they have to build these plants. Well, they can't build them up there. They have to ship them in components. Well, these components are like as big as this building. So they're shipping them up the Col Columbia River and transporting them by truck on two-lane highways across Idaho and across Montana and then north to uh, Alberta. Now, if you saw one of these, and this is the largest, most amazing caravan, massive caravan of trucking in the history of the world, because if you saw these things coming, they have to change all the, all the you know, engineering configuration of these roads in order to handle this equipment. This equipment is like moving like four houses at a time. This stuff is so big. Um, and, and the communities up there are asking some serious questions about, well, wait a second. I mean, well, you know, they've got to move buildings. They've got to change the highways. They've got to change, the, I mean, all of it. But that's the only place in the country that people are asking these kind of questions. And we're not learning about this. I mean, even though it's television ready. I mean, a picture, <laughs> this is television ready. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that we're, you know, we're, we're going to be doing. Um, this is a, this, this uh, natural gas development, deep shale development, has come to Michigan too. 10,000 feet below Masaki County, this well was drilled earlier this year and produced 2,500, 2,000, 2, 2.5 million cubic feet of natural gas a day. That's a huge well for Michigan. And now it's producing 800,000 cubic feet per day. 
And this well prompted the largest lease sale in the history of the state of Michigan. $180 million was invested in May on 100,000. I mean, leases were going for 5,000 bucks an acre, which is unheard of in the state of Michigan. Um, and we now have a lease sale coming up in October in our state to see if this development, which is called the Collingwood Shale, is going to spur even more kinds of deep shale. This well took 6 million gallons of water to frack. Now, we have a lot of water in the state of Michigan, but they had to take this water out of an aquifer, and that raises real questions about, you know, is the state looking at the interplay of water to, need to frack these wells? The state assures us, you know, everything's under control. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to know, we wanted to look really carefully at the politics of this. I mean, remember, 40% increase in production and demand to meet production, declining freshwater resources. If we do it the way we did it in the 20th century, we're going to have very serious problems, really serious problems that we're going to grapple with. You know, how's it going to go? So we went to Kern County. Anybody from California? All right, Kern County? All right. Kern County is east of <coughs> Los Angeles and north. It's right you know, in the southern sort of San Joaquin there. It's the largest oil-producing county in the country. $10 billion worth of oil flows out of Kern County every year. It's also one of the largest agriculture counties. Uh, it has a farm gate value of $4 billion. So we have major farmers and major oil producers. So we figured, you know, if we're going to look at where, how this is going to go, that's a good place to look because... These are nice conservative farmers, got a lot of money, know how to play politically, and of course the oil industry knows how to play. Well, it's not even a contest. I mean, this is like, you know, the New Orleans Saints against your high school football team. It isn't even, <laughs> it isn't even, it isn't even close. California's been in the midst of a very significant drought. Farmers in, in, in Kern County, which who receive most of their irrigation water through the federal and state aqueduct system, uh, through snowmelt from the Sierras, have been gated back on their water allotments very significantly. To, you know, 30%, they're receiving 30% in some years, and some of them even less. Um, now they're receiving 50% because there's been a little bit of dra break in the drought. Oil producers use 8.4 billion gallons of water, in the same water to, fret, you know, to, get, to d develop this oil. They got as much as they want. There was no cutback, none, in the middle of this drought for Kern County oil production, which gives us an idea, which is why, as a journalist, I have to think... If production comes first and the oil industry, bless its heart, has this kind of political influence, and we as a nation have two values at work for us, choice and mobility, and clearly as a nation we're willing to pursue that at all costs. That's what the BP Gulf disaster showed me. We got some stuff to worry about. We really do. This is also Kern County, the... Um, pollution that comes from uh, producing that oil, but that's another issue. Let's, let's just move on. We look really hard at coal. Um, we mine a billion tons of coal a year in the United States. If we go to 40% increase in production, we need to mine 1.4 billion tons of coal in the United States. That's a ton of coal. That's a lot of coal. And we need to move that coal. Right now, even with the Sierra Club's very significant successes from an environmental standpoint in shutting down or delaying or preventing or blocking over 100 new coal-fired power plants in the United States over the last couple of years, the utilities are nevertheless have been able to permit and construct or are under construction 32 new coal plants around the country, 17.9 gigawatts, 17,900 megawatts of power. It's the biggest increase in coal-producing power plants in a generation. It's the biggest increase in coal production in, in, in a generation in this country. It will produce 125 million more tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. It will use tens of billions of gallons of water for cooling and for, and for, and for operations. The coal industry and the United States and the world are pushing steadily, maybe, toward carbon capture and sequestration, to dealing with the carbon emissions from coal. And that technology is called carbon capture and sequestration. Essentially what it does is put the, put the chemical plant on the front of the coal plant in order to separate climate-changing gases. We learned during this process, during this project, 
that CCS technology itself will increase water use at coal plants from 40 to 90 percent. Will nearly double in some cases the water use of these coal plants. So if you think about coal as a logical backdrop, default position for the United States because we got a technology that can begin to deal with CO2 emissions, well, from the water standpoint, we have some significant problems. So let me end and then open to Jeff's presentation. What are we going to do about What are we going to do about this? <laughs> Jeff will fix it. I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> some water. You know, I, you know, as a journalist, as a, I think you, I mean, this is some, go to circleofblue.org and see the, some of this data. We have a lot of data visualizations that get these facts out. The, the story I'm painting here is grim. We can solve it. There's, we, but we can't solve it under the principles that we're operating under. It won't be solved under the principles of production first and choice and mobility as being our highest values the way we did it in the 21st century. We won't solve it. It will get worse. We have to solve it. 400 billion gallons water withdrawn, 40% increase in, current, in the current technology. What is that? That's 560 billion gallons of water withdrawn. Let's see, no. 280, we need 280 for whatever. <laughs> we need to withdraw more water under, if we current practices. It's going to get worse. This is just current technology. It's going to get worse if we pursue clean energy without some very serious changes in vector in how we approach it. And we have till 2050, so we've got some time to address this. So among all of the many structural challenges facing the United States of America in the 21st century, Circle of Blue has uncovered and described another. And it certainly needs to be very close to the top of that priority list of change. Thank you. OK, we got this guy needs some. And for Kyle, too. Actually, can you see the standing the one on the table? Instead of the hand one, so then sure. you can be free to wave your arms. <laughs> and you can use this little. Um, Good job. There's the, the, the. Oh, just the use the arrow. Part. Just use the arrow key on that. Are you guys depressed? <laughs> it's the beginning of the project. The, the next stage is the solutions, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. right. That's why we're. You have to here. identify problems before you can find solutions. We have another hour to solve this. We yeah, we will solve. <laughs> we have another. Hour. And Jeff will start us on that path. All right, that's, that's good. Is this, do I need to click something? There we go. Well, thank you for setting that up. Uh, that <laughs> killed about 50 of my opening slides. No, that, I tell you, this is fantastic data. And I am thrilled with what Circle of Blue is doing because it's a, it's a huge wake-up call, and the uh, U.S. isn't getting it. Uh, it it's unbelievable that it's going to take a, a greater catastrophe around water in order to wake up this uh, this country and the world. Although I would argue, as I travel around, a lot of the world is waking up before we are. Um, you know, we can talk about developing worlds. We're going to go teach. Well, I tell you what, we need to do a little learning here too. Um, it, it, it's really interesting. I, I spent about 17 years in Atlanta, and uh, those that are familiar with uh, 2007 major drought in Atlanta, kind of centered in Chattanooga. Uh, fortunately, Tennessee has uh, the Tennessee River flowing at about 17 times the volume of the Chattahoochee River, which is the main water supply for the city of Atlanta, becomes the border of Georgia and Alabama. That whole situation in the southeast Atlanta, Lake Lanier, the watershed for the city of Atlanta, was down to less than 60 days of capacity. In fact, some would say less than 30 days. It was just all kind of gyrations. The la latter part of 2007, Governor Perdue was praying on the state house lawn. You know, all all this going on. Uh, Georgia Power, or Southern Company, the, the largest water withdrawer in, uh, in Georgia, was looking at massive changes in their power plants. Just a lot of great behavior. Well, unfortunately, the prayers worked. It rained, and all is forgotten. <laughs> so here we are. Fast forward three years later. Um, Lake Lanier is full now, and we can't move a project forward in Georgia. It, it's, it's, the, the behavior is really interesting around water. Uh, met with a group of mayors recently, and we were talking about water challenges. And of the group of mayors in the room, we were talking about uh, everybody was on board. We have to change this behavior and everything. And yet the majority of the mayors in the room represented cities that didn't even meter water or charge for water. There was no understanding of consumption at the local level. So if you don't know what you're using, how are you ever going to change those behaviors? So there's all these disconnects between what we've heard this morning 
and the realities of what were going out, on out there. So what I want to do is just take you through hopefully a little bit of optimism. Uh, there is, <laughs> there are some, some, there's some good news in this situation, and um, some of my uh, pages may seem a little lame this morning. I would, you know, they, uh, because they they aren't the whole solution. But I wanted to share kind of a handful of this the thoughts around the energy water nexus, and you heard a lot of that th this morning. But I've kind of come up with. I'm just going to share kind of seven of these nexes. Is that a word? With you, <laughs> and uh, there's a lot more. Uh, I'm not getting in the agricultural space. There's so much opportunity in ag, and it's a whole other uh, program. Seventy percent of the world's water supply goes to agriculture, and yet the majority, or the vast majority of that, is either free. It's unmetered. It's uh, it, there's there's no policy around agricultural use today. There's low flow irrigation technologies available that would reduce that by seventy percent. So we could reduce the water's world's consumption seventy percent of the of the world's consumption by seventy percent, or in other words, cut fifty percent of the world's water consumption out just by smarter irrigation that's available today. But again, without why would a farmer go spend money to reduce his consumption if there is no charge for that water? So it's this, it's, there's just so many disconnects between policy and behavior. So we'll get into a little bit of that today. So let me take you through just a couple of thoughts. We've heard enough of the, the data. We know we're going to need a heck of a lot more water in order to meet this energy uh, challenge of the future. If you think about just, we, we talked a lot about power generation. The power plants that were built over the last 100 years uh, typically use once-through water to cool their systems. So they draw water in. It's, it's the difference between withdrawal and consumption. Where, you know, there's, there's a different point there. So if you take 100,000 gallons emitted in to, to cool a condenser, that water comes back out the other side of the plant. There's about a 3% loss there. You pick up a little bit of uh, contaminants and heat. But still, there is a, we need to make sure that, that we're at least wise about how we look at withdrawal versus consumption and those type of things. Heck of a lot of that water goes up the stack. A lot of it, so you see the plume off the cooling tower. All that's going up. Uh, you know, we, a lot of losses also. But going forward, this once-through cooling that we were able to use in the past is no longer allowed or, or you know, in many parts of the world. And so we're going to see a lot more cooling towers, a lot more consumptive use of water to produce that same megawatt of power. So, again, there's some behaviors going forward are going to be more water intensive. That's why we do have to absolutely change our behavior. So this whole idea of takes a heck of a lot of water to produce power, it takes a lot of power to produce, move, uh, transport water. And this whole idea, we've got to reduce before we produce. I mean, it's nuts to sit there and just constantly try to come up with more volume of water before we aggressively and actively try to reduce our consumptive behavior. And across all the sectors, there's a heck of a lot of low-hanging fruit that we can go after in, in water consumption. So let me touch on a couple of these nexi. Is that the plural <laughs> of nexus? Anyway. Uh, Thought around nexus number one here. Depending on whose numbers you read, it's three, six, all the way up to 19% of a uh, typical city's energy consumption goes to make, produce, pump, move water around. California being at the high end of that, they're the uh, they're the winner with the 19%, and that's a lot of it. those that have spent any time there. The 300 mile, there's a lot of piping of water uh, up and down uh, through the state in order to bring the uh, wetter northern water down to the to the drier south. But this, this whole idea of traditional water treatment technology is you have a major in, a municipal center, you have big honking 100 million gallon a day water treatment plans to produce the water, you pump it through hundreds of miles of piping, and then you collect it at the other end, the low side of the city, in wastewater treatment plants, big honking centralized facilities, and then you clean it up a little bit and discharge it. So it's this idea of it's a once-through system, pull it in, use it once, throw it out the back end, clean it up sort of, and discharge it. And that might be from a river or, uh, or uh, wells and aquifers discharged back to the sea. So it's this whole idea of, of once-through. But that, that transportation of that water is a tremendous energy sucker. And so one of the relatively simple things that we're seeing in a lot of areas is this whole just basic distributed systems. Smaller, more energy efficient uh, water and wastewater facilities out close to where the water is being consumed. An example of this, simple ex example, this is in Battery Park, Solaire Building. There's a wastewater treatment plant, a small system sitting in the basement of this building that reuses 98% of the water in the building. And if you think about it, in a, in a big commercial building, there's very little water goes to human consumption or human contact. Most of it's going to laundry, to irrigation, to a whole bunch of other uses, fire protection. So this system was, is two separate sets of pipes, but it's a, just a wise use of water in a commercial building. We're seeing a lot more uh, buildings. LEED certification, unfortunately, LEED today only has a few points for water, but still, it's, uh, we're, we're seeing more attention to water in commercial building. 
But as we think about the 400 new cities of over a million people that are built in China, 200 cities in India, as you start thinking about the massive uh, municipal construction that's going to take place over the next 30 or 40 years, an opportunity to get it right from the beginning to rethink the way we utilize water in a, in a commercial building. Another example, this is actually a wastewater treatment plant for 1,400 homes, uh, and this sits in this 8,000 square foot house. That's, you know, it, so you can, the old vision of what a wastewater treatment plant looks like, <laughs> technology enables us to shrink this footprint way down. Much higher quality water coming out the back end enables reuse. In this case, the, this water is going for reuse within the irrigation in the community, irrigation in agriculture, irrigation of a local golf course. And so it's just wise use. The energy consumption in a system like this can be 20 to 30 percent less or more, uh, even greater reduction, because you're very close to the end user here. Um, so next, another next, next eye would be this idea of uh, that we have to be aware that the higher technologies that are going to be needed to treat the lower quality water going forward are more energy intensive. Uh, you know, Keith talked about some of these trade-offs. There's, there's a lot of trade-offs between the need for this energy, the need for cleaner water, and a higher energy consumption. Traditional water treatment technology is kind of uh, run water through a sand filter and various filtration devices, shove some chlorine in it, and send it out to, to us as the consumers. Going forward, the contaminants that are in this water, including those contaminants that are caused by unconventional uh, oil and gas exploration, are not uh, you can't treat those with traditional technologies. So you're looking at membrane technologies, you're looking at other things that are more energy intensive. So we've got to understand those trade-offs, be wise about it. Again, reduce before we produce so that we can get to the point where when we do uh, create some new sources of water, we do it wisely and more energy efficiently. Now the good news is there's a lot of energy being taken out of these new uh, technologies. So over the last uh, couple of decades, desalination alone, we've reduced the uh, energy consumption by over 80% in the, uh, in the technologies to desalinate. Water reuse technology is even a, m a much lower energy consumption. So there's this opportunity going forward to be uh, much uh, more wise about the energy water trade-off with some of these technologies. So at General Electric, we're doing a lot to continue this development. As we kind of go forward, a lot of new, just the scientific stuff up here, but we're looking at uh, a lot of different technologies going forward to uh, low energy membranes, energy recovery devices. Um, uh, we're, we're looking at leapfrog technology. It won't necessarily be reverse osmosis going forward. It might be... Uh, uh, forward osmosis, we're looking at deep sea to use the pressure of the sea for desalination instead of pump. You know, so there's, there's some really creative ways, and I have no doubt that from a technology standpoint, the next five to ten years are going to be some massive leapfrogs in water treatment technology, hopefully some of those from us, uh, that will enable us to be much, uh, much lower energy consumers to produce the water that we need going forward. But again, let's reduce before we produce that water. Another kind of just uh, a little commercial here. Um, we, we put together a fund a couple of months ago, a $200 million fund, uh, to look at kind of open source, look at some new technologies, what kind of great inventions are out there around the world for alternate, um, alternate energy. And if you uh, go to ecomagination.com, uh, but uh, this is actually, this is off, their website, off our website from a day or two ago. What you see here is actually, this is a time horizon from the left to the right, moving toward the end of September when we're uh, collecting the, the, all the entries. We have roughly, I think, 2,200 entries so far from about 45,000 people. Each one of these little dots represents an idea. And so behind that, you can read about that idea. The ones, the larger circles, people are open source, able to vote and say, I like that one. So the, the larger the circles are the ones that are getting the vote. So we're finding some really cool new ideas coming in here for energy storage. Uh, you've kind of think about it in three basic buckets. There's the energy production piece, the energy transportation piece, smart grid ideas, and then the energy consumption piece. So really cool ideas. And what we through this $200 million uh, fund, we want to be able to get some, some horsepower behind these new ideas in order to bring them forward, to be able to accelerate the progress of some of these new technologies. And where it might you know, take years on, a, on, on their own, we can put our research, uh, research group behind this and some funding <laughs> behind it to really accelerate what I think is going to be some breakthrough technologies uh, in order to move forward. Energy storage is one of the big uh, you know, inhibitors to a, a much larger play in solar and wind and some of the, you know, the, the more uh, uh, secular, uh, uh, 
the, the, the in, in, uh, gosh, intermittent uh, technologies. And so energy storage is one of the things we see some really cool ideas. Another nexus, um, and you saw this, I stole one of your pictures earlier, but the, this idea of the declining reservoirs. And this is, is not a, a massive solution here, but we do see incremental improvement in, again, through some water reuse technologies. This little red barn here you see here is actually a, a, a a uh, Cully Creek plant sits in Gwinnett County, um, just a, a couple of miles from Lake Lanier. What was happening before is the wastewater that was generated in the local communities was continuing to go into rivers and streams down and go right to the ocean. What we're doing now is treating several million gallons a day of wastewater and returning that right back to Lake Lanier in order to, again, it isn't good, it doesn't make a, a huge den in a reservoir the size of Lake Lanier, about 66 miles long, but we are looking at constantly moving up the ladder to take reuse, uh, water reuse, and bring it to higher value applications, not just for irrigation, but we can clean it to, to purity greater than, than drinking water quality. So we're returning it to reservoirs like Lake Lanier. Orange County, California has one of the largest reuse uh, facilities that's actually returning to the aquifer that's providing water to the city of Los Angeles. So this idea of don't use it once and dump it and all of that energy and all that, you can put a little bit more tertiary treatment in and be able to reuse that and, and replenish uh, the aquifers going forward. Um, a, a great example of this overall, just thoughtful, sustainable planning is Singapore. Um, granted, it's a small, you know, 4.8 million people relatively contained, but uh, it's fantastic thought over the last 10 years to really create a sustainable water plan. Those are familiar with Singapore, uh, you know, over the last... Uh, before the last 10 to 15 years, completely reliant on Malaysia for the water supply. Large pipe coming from Malaysia. And it was, a, it was becoming a political issue among other challenges. So forward thinking, they came up with a four-tap four tap theory. Part of the water will continue to come from Malaysia, but that will become a declining proportion. Second piece is a very thoughtful uh, use of capturing rainwater. So a series of reservoirs throughout Singapore. The third area is around water reuse. They have embraced water reuse in Singapore, in fact, branded it as new water, and it's actually a premium brand of water because it is consistently high purity treated water. And so that becomes a great source of water for the industrial markets and others. That's over 30% of Singapore's water consumption now is new water. And then the fourth tap is desalination, which is, as it should be, the last choice. Uh, desal is a great technology, but it is expensive, and it is energy hog. So we, we, it should be the final choice. You know, when you don't have anything, it, when, when all other sources have been exhausted, uh, desalination is there. So again, thoughtful water policy is something that this city that we're in today could certainly learn from. And we need to be proactive and, and put together a policy that, is, that we all march to the same, uh, uh, same end point. Fourth nexus here, again, heard a lot about this already this morning, takes a huge amount of water. 49% of the U.S. water withdrawals are to go to, to uh, generate power. And the, just what we, what we work every day with our clients on is just be smart about the way that water is consumed. Three basic areas, if you think about how water is consumed in a power plant, this idea of source to use. There's an incoming water supply. It might be seawater. might be well water. might be river water. That water supply coming in. Let's look at the most sustainable, lowest cost, smartest source of water. So instead of using literally municipal drinking water or uh, freshwater well water, uh, let's look at using alternate. Let's use wastewater reuse. Let's look at alternate lower grade uh, sources of water that can be cleaned up and used in that plant, freeing up the fresh water for human consumption. So secondly, the kind of as you move on through the plant, a tremendous amount of this water is used for cooling systems primarily, and also for to make steam in order to spin the turbine and generate the power. There's much wiser ways to, to use that water. A simple thing, if a cooling tower is there, we're doing a lot of projects now in order to, to take the blowdown water or the wastewater coming out of the cooling tower, run that through a, a treatment device, and reuse that water. You can, you can really tighten up the amount of water wasted from a cooling system just by being smarter. Uh, and, and then finally, at the back end, where water is discharged back to the environment, it's this idea of waste of value. We need to stop thinking about wastewater as a, a liability and turn it into an asset. That wastewater contains a huge amount of carbon. It's got great energy value in it. It has phosphorus. You know, if you read much about what's going on with phosphate right now around the world, we're reaching a point where there isn't enough phosphorus rock to be mined in order to meet the future demands of the agricultural market. Well, let's mine it out of wastewater. There's some great technologies uh, on early stage right now that are able to pull phosphate out of a wastewater supply. Pretty cool way to think differently about that waste stream, not just from a power plant, but uh, every wastewater 
stream that, that uh, is flowing from an industrial or municipality could be a great source of value. So we, we get to rethink the way water is consumed in a power plant. Again, a couple of great ideas. This is uh, actually the in Tempe, uh, a really, uh, it's called the Kyrene uh, um, Reuse Facility here. It's about a 5 million gallon a day water reuse plant. And uh, what Tempe's been able to do is about half to 60% of the water generated here goes to a power plant right next door, literally across the fence. And then the rest of it goes, and it's now they've created a two-mile-long reservoir right in the, in the middle of Tempe, this beautiful uh, uh, recreation facility all from basically an arid desert but it also becomes now their reserve water supply and it's just smarter use this water was again flowing to, to the sea so it's a it's a smart use of reuse this idea of, of waste of value great energy I mentioned earlier before this is uh, actually a plant it's a uh, food processing plant that was able to take their their wastewater uh, convert it into methane gas, burn it in an engine, a uh, very low carbon emission engine, and now they're generating their own energy. In fact, excess uh, energy that, that they can export back to the grid, and they're also generating pure water out of this. So they've created their own water power island within the plant and turned what was a liability to them that was actually running into problems from a discharge standpoint and turned that back into an asset. So we have to rethink what we used to call waste. You've heard already this morning, the unconventional gas space, you know, we talked a lot about this three to seven million gallons of water used to frack a well. What we didn't talk a lot about is what comes out the other end. And what comes up with the gas is tremendously contaminated wastewater, uh, two to three times more salinity than salt water. Uh, and right now, the typical choice of what you do with that wastewater is uh, get rid of it either deep well injection, which takes it out of the hydrologic cycle completely. So now you've got a well in a water-scarce region, and you're eliminating that water from the, from the water cycle. Something wrong there. Or you put it in a very large uh, evaporation pond, and over time your water will evaporate. But again, you've taken it out of that local community's water supply. So we need to rethink that. We're looking at how do you, it, it, it's an intensive operation, but you can clean up and reuse that wastewater that's being generated from those, uh, the unconventional gas and unconventional oil wells. Tremendous opportunity. A lot of our investment in technology is going to this pretreatment and the various systems that will allow you to, to extract this valuable water. Again, another byproduct we get here is salts. You can actually uh, generate a, a very usable road salt, uh, for instance, that we would use in, on our uh, roads here in the Northeast uh, to, to melt the ice. So there, again, look at other ways to be able to turn this waste into value. Um, these are, uh, again, the, one of the challenges here, major trade-off between energy and water. The treatment technologies to treat this wastewater, very energy intensive. These are big evaporator units where you put a huge amount of heat in. Basically, it's a big still. You're, you're uh, creating you know, pure water out of this wastewater. You run them through a series of technologies, go to evaporation, all the way to crystallization or to dryness. And so you're taking this water, extracting all the pure water out, and all your solids end up as a, as a dry solid. So again, great technology, but boy, is it energy intensive. So we have to be wise about the way we use these technologies and continue to take energy out. This is a project right now that's actually an older picture. I think uh, we're operational now, but this is at a coal mine down in Virginia where they're, we're pulling 1,500 gallons a minute of contaminated wastewater out of the mine and uh, recovering and recycling, cleaning this up for, for again, for beneficial reuse. Uh, too often we're ignoring these wastewater streams that are being generated and just, you know, out of sight, out of mind. We have to, uh, to uh, aggressively capture these and clean them up, not leave them for our kids. And then a sixth idea here is this. Uh, this is actually it, one of the challenges we look at globally is India. Um, India has a tremendous energy need also. 60,000 megawatts of power will be built in India over the next uh, several years. And about 85% of the wastewater in India is untreated. So you take those two challenges together. You say, what an opportunity to treat wastewater, could not continue to contaminate our rivers and streams, and use that, that treated wastewater as the water needed for a, a more efficient power plant of the future. Co-locate these, the opportunity to use waste heat from the power operation to enhance the water treatment. There's, we have to rethink these, the, the power plants of the future, not just to get off the drug of fossil fuels, but also rethink the way we design these as an integrated system. It's a system of systems rather than everything kind of working independently. And as we rethink that, we can have significant advantages uh, from an efficiency standpoint. So this whole idea of integrated design going forward, I think, is going to be a, a big trend that we do see. Finally, and I, I always hesitate to bring this one because I always get accused of wanting to raise the price of water. That's 
So let me just go on the record. That's not my goal here. It's not about raising the price of water. It's just pricing water for the value we receive. You know, water is a human right. We get into all these uh, arguments and discussions. The fact is, we, we, th there is a cost associated with treating and moving water around. And if we don't have the right price for water, then we'll never have the money to invest in the infrastructure we need and the smart systems that we need in order to get wise about water consumption of the future. So this, uh, follow me on my little uh, chart here. I, I, I was looking at water price over the last year or so, and I took about 180 some odd data points from around the world on water price by major cities. Um, and so if you, if you Follow my little chart here. If you move across the, the horizontal axis, left to right is low cost on the left, high cost on the right. Basic, you know, for round trip of how much you're going to pay for your water. On the y-axis, going up the left side, from the bottom to the top is relative re renewable supplies of water. So in other words, the bottom is dry. That's, uh, I think, Saudi Arabia bottom. Top is high renewable supply, a lot of rainwater, you know, the, the uh, wet areas of Brazil. So. You know, normal thought would say, okay, this makes sense. If you got a lot of water, it's going to be very cheap. You don't have much water, it's going to be very expensive. And in fact, the data, the, there is uh, almost Zippo correlation there. <laughs> in fact, what you end up with is, is this big pile of data at bottom left corner, which means very water scarce, free. Um, so <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> how are we ever going to change behavior? It's like when gas is, you know, 50 cents, everybody's driving there. Oops. Hummer. Yeah, Hummer, whatever. <laughs> uh, it was, you know, when you think about back when we were four or five bucks, the, I, was, I remember reading the paper one morning. It was Ford F-150 sales were down 17%, and they showed a line, you know, waiting for a Prius, you know, all the way around the Toyota dealer. So, and then as soon as price is back down in the two-buck range, all of a sudden everybody's driving an Escalade again. So uh, like water or like gasoline, water is similarly, there's a similar behavior. So that cluster in the bottom left corner, these are some of the most water-scarce areas of the world where water is completely subsidized. One of the highest per capita consumptions of water is in Saudi Arabia. Uh, also the largest desalination you know, uh, capacity in the world. So again, we've got to be wise in the way that we think about the finances around water. This whole idea of shifting from a price to value, think about it today, most of water pricing is based on volume. You get a volume-based discount. The more you use, the cheaper it is. Something, again, out of whack there. So we have to decouple price from volume is one of the simple things. So we have to rethink the way that we approach price price in the future. Um, Catherine Garcia is a great lady in the city of New York. She is responsible for the water systems of New York. They've uh, really, over the last several years, continued to reduce consumption very aggressively in New York. She said it's great. They were down 16% in 2009. Unfortunately, her revenues were down 16% in 2009. So again, if you think about how does a water company operate in the future, we have to we just got to be smarter about it. Because what it's done is it's reduced her ability to reinvest in aging infrastructure in the city of New York. So again, just we have to be wise. The other piece here is the policy uh, component. And uh, fortunately, around the world, we're seeing some pretty positive behaviors around policy, particularly around reuse. Beijing uh, recently put a target out for 100% uh, water reuse in Beijing by 2013. We're seeing great change in behavior around Inner Mongolia and the Yellow River Basin, which is uh, a really a, a just a, it's probably one of the, the most intense challenges of water in the world. Uh, so we, we are seeing positive behaviors. Israel, fantastic uh, progress in Israel because they have to. You know? So we, we shouldn't have to wait till we get to a ca uh, catastrophic situation before we wise up. Unfortunately, here in the U.S., we're less than 6% reuse. I also show some of the policy around renewables. Uh, around, we see some great behavior. Over 70 countries around the world have renewable policy in place. U.S., we're at less than 3% renewables today because, we, again, we need a cohesive policy around water and energy that we can get our, our, uh, our arms behind. I see Pete and team over here. We're working on a project with uh, uh, World Resource Institute and Goldman Sachs uh, around water risk index. What we're trying to do is look at what are not just the traditional um, data points you might think about which create water risk in a given in, uh, geography. So it's not just consumptive behavior and uh, volume of water. It's not just supply and demand. But there's a lot of social uh, economic uh, issues. There's a lot of policy issues. There's You've got to look at the long-term trends of demand versus supply. So all of these various uh, disparate pieces of data are being brought together into a fin fantastic tool going forward. Uh, we're calling the Water Risk Index or a new name to be determined. So again, some, some great work going on 
here, so stay tuned. Uh, WRI has a lot of information on their, their site, but it's uh, going to be a really powerful tool. If you think about it, you'd say, wow, Goldman, why would they be interested? But if you're an investor and you're looking at a long-term investment in a given potential water-scarce region, to be able to really understand what's that going to do to potentially impact you know, 10 to 20 years from now, it's a, it's a great tool. I look at it as a water opportunity tool because uh, what we're looking at is where are those places, where are those choke points in the world that need uh, a change of behavior, need, need new technologies in order to get uh, to change their outcomes. So, again, just a handful of some of the next eye that we see going forward and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, appreciate all your guys' great data. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. So you guys feeling a little better now? A little better? Okay. Um, doesn't mean you can't be tough. I've got Cushing and with a microphone. Who uh, we are, We're webcasting live, later archived. So if you can, um, when you get the microphone, just say your name and affiliation and your succinct question. Many of you, time somewhat limited. And answers probably long-winded. No. <laughs> All right, let's go. Uh, hands up if you have a question. And Cushing, right over the woman right on the inside. He'll be. Right here. There you go. This on? Yeah. Excellent. I'm Samantha Gross with IHS CIRA, and I have a question about consumption versus withdrawal and the issue of cooling. Um, is, is closed loop cooling necessarily the answer, given that you have less withdrawal but much more consumption? It seems like that might be somewhat spe situation specific, and I'm wondering if the push towards closed loop cooling is necessarily right for every, everyone in every place. Give your perspective on that first. I have mine. But. As Jeff said, the, the trade off there, and as you described, is pretty significant. Um, and in talking to the scientists at Sandia who are working, who worked on that roadmap, this was one of their one of their points that they wanted to fully explore from a research standpoint. And what we're learning is that it's a matter of location. So in some areas, it makes sense if you're building your new power plants along the coast. Of course, that if it's a coal-burning power plant, that raises all kinds of civic and political questions and pushback at the, at, the, at the local level about whether it's even possible to build those plants there or how difficult it's going to be to build those plants there. Uh, or does it make more sense to build that plant in Wyoming, you know, where they produce the coal and produce the fuel? Can they use a closed loop? Well, that it probably makes sense from a withdrawal standpoint because they don't have as much water just to withdraw. Um, as Jeff was describing, we have enough water. W you know, we're, we change how we do f our agricultural practices, which use in this country too. F half the water withdrawals mostly come from agriculture, and 85% or more of the consumption is in agriculture. So there's opportunity there to adjust our farming practices in all assets of food production, livestock, and crops um, to produce energy. So um, there are answers that need from a policy point of view which is what are we going to encourage in different areas which the government our government which has certainly the technical know-how to figure this out and to make some some suggestions that we're not willing to make and let me say one thing about this report which i was i found really surprising that we wouldn't adjust that report but we got we got a paper we wrote about it on the website that sort of describes sort of describes what's in this report that they don't want to release and if you look at what they're talking about and the kinds of research that's needed, essentially you're goring every ox that's out there, including the environmental community's ox. You know, you're looking at clean energy, which has been the call and the cry of certainly since 2008 in the, in the presidential election. All the candidates, Republican and, and Democrats, are talking about this. Um, well, wait a second. From a water standpoint, this isn't going to work the way we're looking at it. it it's going to be a water penalty. That's an enormous finding an enormous impediment that that alone thinking about who who in the, who in the political um, matrix doesn't want that report to be re made public everybody doesn't want that report to be made public just one, one other comment and, and it really is absolutely location specific if you think about it again not just as that one plant but the the system of systems where does that fit in the overall watershed you know, what's the source of water flowing to that, and where does the water go that leaves that plant? In many cases, once through is actually a benefit because it passes on down and, and provides the water on downstream. So one of the concerns about 
closed loop and or cooling cooling towers is if if your water you may withdraw less water but if the evaporative losses coming off that cooling system end up taking a, a lot of water out of the local watershed that can also be a real concern and so uh, it, it it really the, the struggle with policy is we don't want to jam one solution because we have to we just have to take into account the broader impact on that watershed and it's a it's a big deal uh, some places the ones through systems are causing a thermal challenge in the river. You know, a lot of it mentioned the Chattahoochee River before. Plant Yates, which sits down south of Atlanta, uh, was, had a lot of thermal issues where it was increasing the r river temperature to the point where it was starting to impact marine life and causing problems downstream. So there they had to put in a cooling system just to cool the discharge in order to kind of meet the, the restrictions of that uh, a, a water-scarce river in a warm region of the country. So you know, it's the good old answer, it depends, right? Okay, and right here, Cushing, we'll just move up and then pass it to the gentleman in the white shirt right there. No hijacking on the way. There we go. Good job. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> uh, Gene Brantley with RTI International. Uh, we are very much involved in water issues both domestically as well as through our international development practice. Um, I really, really appreciate your, your presentations this morning. They've been very motivating and uh, uh, making me much more enthusiastic about what we're doing. Uh, I have a question that I want to take all three of you sort of um, a step beyond the topics you've already addressed. You talked a lot about um, what's going on I in sort of local political contexts, uh, who has influence and who is or is not aware of the problems in taking action. Um, <clears throat> and there was also a lot of conversation about technology solutions. Uh, if, if you look at governance, um, what you know, other than making people more aware or, or trying to alter who has influence, are there structural changes in how we are governing choices about water and where those choices are being made um, that you either observe uh, being tried out where there's some, some, some good track record of that or uh, problems you've had in, in instituting um, potential solutions that, that are really there uh, from which you can draw some conclusions about how the the uh, governance structures might work better. Thank you. Okay. And if you could just pass the mic down there, so he'll have it in 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 a, in a moment, right behind you there. Okay, giving you a few seconds yeah, to. Governance. governance. Oh gosh. I, oh gosh. You know. Governance. It's a lively. Uh, um, here's what I know as a journalist doing this project and in my own, in in other work I'm doing. Um, we are a much smarter nation than our, most of our political leaders either want to uh, uh, acknowledge or admit. And the best governance for this kinds of, these kinds of uh, you know, choke points is happening at the munici munici municipal level. And the worst, of course, is right here in your fine city. Um, the nation is not positioned appropriately, that's a kind way of saying this, to respond to the market trends that are facing us in the United States and the world. We're not positioned appropriately, meaning that our central values, to me the central values of American culture and American society, as I said before, is choice and mobility choice in being able to do what you want to do and to do it where you want to do it is really, really important. Now, we used to use, you used to think about this in a different way when we all rode horses, but now we drive cars and we can go and we spread our civilizations out and we expect, we anticipate and expect that these resources are unlimited and we can get them. We turn on the tap, we're going to get water, we go to the gas station, we're going to get gas, we get a job, we're going to be paid enough to, to live a life of, of uh, you know, of, of great um, value to ourselves and our families and our friends and our communities. All right, that to, to, to a large extent still exists in our ability to govern ourselves at the local level. So at the local level around these issues, there has been mostly civic pushback, principally around unconventional fuel sources, principally in the Northeast. And so New York instituted a moratorium because people were really, really upset about what the consequences of the fracking and the water would be. And New York then moved it up to the legislature and their regulatory agencies, and I think they're going to do a pretty decent job on regulating, mitigating the consequences. But in the 20th century on environmental issues, the 20th century environmental 
uh, value system was about mitigation and preservation. So that's what we did over the last 40 to 50 years in terms of you know, managing resources. We mitigated the consequences of industrial industrialization, and we preserved land, uh, species, farmland, coastal lands. You know, that's deep. Well, these issues are different dimension. This is not about mitigation and preservation. It's about responding to market trends in order to be able to thrive. And I didn't say survive, but I said thrive. The environmental policy agenda is not really well equipped. The country is not really well equipped to deal with that, particularly today where fear and preservation, what is the central preservation goal of the United States of America and Americans today, is to preserve what we got, to preserve the home, the cars, the place we live, to try to, the jobs, the way of life we have. Well, the way of life we have, as we learn just in water, but we also know it in others, isn't working. It's not working. That's why people are so, so struggling with this. And we need, and this is the last thing I say, at the national level, we need lawmakers to respond to the market signals that are coming, not the political market signals, the market signals. And until they do, until they leverage resources at the federal level in order to leverage private investments, the kinds that, that Jeff has been talking about, provide the resources to leverage, not pay for it all, but provide the start of money, we're not going to get anywhere, in my view, on these or any other issues. Where the progress is going to come is at the municipal level, and it's going to come from the major prov providers of the technology and the equipment who can, as you know, $200 million funds, who see the threat to their own businesses and need help. They're going to do it themselves. Well, that's a different concept for America the last 50 years. You know, America the last 50 years said, we're going to have this leadership, we're going to invest this kind of money, and we're going to send people to the moon, we're going to build hi interstate highways, we're going to build public water systems, we're going to protect the land. It's, we're not in that place anymore. Let me just ad address that, just a couple of, of points, because I do see some positive things going on, um, not necessarily outside of the boundaries of this building, um, but um, <laughs> a couple of things. Water rights, we've kind of touched on, I mean, you talk about a, you want to set off a, a fire, you know, a, a keg of dynamite. Um, we're, we're so antiquated with water rights. I mean, what, 1913, I forget when, you know, the whole, mm. the, the way water rights are determined today. Um, Alberta is experimenting. The Alberta Water Research Institute is starting a, an interesting experiment. They're just going to do it kind of with monopoly money first, but they're going to start a trading, uh, water rights trading experiment this next year. And in that, they're going to look at what will water rise to a value if if allowed, if rights are allowed to be traded. One of the drivers there is if you think about Alberta and Saskatchewan, the, the, the both basins, the uh, Athabasca River Basin, I mean, they mentioned about the oil sands. I mean, we're sucking that plentiful river is being sucked dry. And so there, it, it, right now it's over allocated. There's more withdrawal permits, if you will, than even the volume in that river. So they're looking at rethinking what will happen if, if a farmer, for instance, allowed to get value for his water rights and trade that off. So could be a, going down a rat hole, but I think we have to experiment in some different ways to be able to think differently about water rights going forward, not unlike carbon trading. We need to think about how do we create a value on water to enable trading. Another interesting thing I see going on is the visibility of data, and this is, goes for energy and water at the home level, at, at a lot of different levels. If people are, if they know what you're doing and you have an option to improve, I think, I just believe that we will do a lot of the right thing. So a lot of, I think, what's the, the benefit that's going to come from the smart grid, both for energy and if we can tie smart grid for water into that. If I know, for instance, that I can get water at 50% discount at 2 a.m. because, you know, from a demand load standpoint, and I have timer on my fancy front load washing machine, you know, there, there's the decisions that we can make as consumers that will, yeah, it may be an incremental, but if you incremental times millions of people, we can make a difference. And I think smart grid, understanding, same thing with your appliance from an energy standpoint. So bringing visibility, same thing on the industrial side. We do a lot of benchmarking, so we can share, for instance, a, with a steel mill in China, their water consumption per ton of steel produced versus best in class. And I tell you what, they people want to be best in class. They want to be top quartile. And so just bringing visibility to that information, you see behavioral shift 
not because they have to. I don't think it takes policy. It's not going to take hitting somebody with a stick. I think that behavior will change if you can bring people a better way to be able to reach that. And the third and final example of that is we deal with a, um, a major bearings manufacturer. And uh, this bearings manufacturer is both a supplier to us as well as a customer. And in China, they're having problems meeting the demand because they have a very high uh, – um, just a, a great environmental footprint, and their environmental footprint goes way up into the supply chain. They're having a hard time getting the supply of castings and some of the metals that they need in China because their suppliers can't meet the, the, their environmental challenge. They're polluters. And so what's happening is a great behavior is the their suppliers, local Chinese suppliers, absolutely want to be a, a long-term sustainable supplier to this, this multinational. So they're cleaning up their act. We're actually kind of climbing through the supply chain and helping their, uh, these, these local um, fab shops clean up their act improve the environmental footprint, reduce their water consumption, not because they have to, not because the government's telling them they have to, but they know that in order to be a supplier in the future and be sustainable, they're going to have to. So I think I see great, uh, I don't know, just progress and, and a really positive future around a lot of the sustainability action. The role that I'm in, I didn't even know what it was when I was, I've been in this role about three months, chief sustainability. What did I do to deserve that? Uh, <laughs> I'm loving it because the, it, it allows us to really think differently, to not only make sure that GE is sustainable and reduce our, we have 7,000 rooftops. We've got a lot of facilities around the world. So not only make sure that we're sustainable, we've reduced our water consumption by over 30 percent, and I think we can get to 50 percent. You know, same thing on energy. We but it, as I work and travel around the world, I mean, over over 25 percent of the Fortune 500 companies now have chief sustainability officers. We're, they're taking it seriously. So I think industry can help really drive this change without having to wait for Washington or wait for whoever to wake up. So I'm an optimist, I guess. I think before Carl leaps, I wanted to ask ask yep. you, Chief, um, you gave the example about the, the coal mine in Virginia that was recovering yep. their wastewater. And my first thought was, why? What, what, what motivated this, this, this coal mine to say, I'm going to recycle? Was it pressure from communities, from policy? It was policy, the need or for water. It was what? It was the need for, need water. for water. They could not get, if you think about the uh, Chesapeake Basin, I mean, Chesapeake has mm -hmm. done very proactive. Uh, that w volume of water was not available to continue their operations and expand their operations. So it was more a matter of uh, their sustainability versus, again, policy telling them you've got to do this. Um, but the thing so is that we don't want, you know, they hit the choke point and they had to act, but... You're, the question kind of in, how do we was get that, that ahead of the how do we get the governance right? so we're not always just quick. okay yeah. so same question we're going to move fast here because we got a lot of cool questions and cool answers yes okay um, Brian Bruns I'm a sociologist and independent consultant worked on water rights and various other things and so the general question is like if you're looking at these choke points or next eye um, what you've done to try and sort out okay which ones are look really, really tough, and which ones are easier and open to solution? We know in energy over the last few decades, we've been through big transitions to less energy intensive approach, and pl price has played a big part of that. We know in water institutions and water rights, it's very politicized, it's very messy, things move slowly, but they do change, but it usually takes decades, and it takes a crisis or series of crises. So whether you've tried to sort out these different nexi into you know, which ones are low-hanging fruit, like you mentioned, you know, water reuse and um, uh, closed-loop systems, you know, maybe lo low-hanging fruit, you know, things need to change and easier, and which things look really tough or it becomes really crucial to have, you know, political governance kind of discussions and solutions. Thanks. Well, okay. a quick, quick answer from me um, is... Uh, Starting with the fruit, and that's on the agriculture side, which Jeff mentioned. I mean, that's the largest user of water globally. And so if we are able to be, produce our agriculture much more efficiently, now that's a big sociological question, too, because if you're a corn farmer, how do you switch to amaranth? Um, and if that's all you know, um, if there are subsidies for particular products, how do you, how do you transition? Again, back to mm -hmm. valuing for biofuels. How do you start valuing that? So agriculture is a place to start. And I think, um, I think the other key here, too, is we're starting to see, the fa we're talking about Nexi. We're <laughs> we're, can we, we, I guess we can settle on that. Um, we're starting to see that we are looking at these as fully intersecting. I mean, you know, probably two or three years ago, we were looking, the water people really didn't talk to the energy people, really didn't talk to the agriculture people. And then there were the health, the health 
you know, the, the water and health people who are doing incredible things with you know, wash and schools and whatnot. But we're taking that orbital perspective and we're starting to map out what the impacts are when we save here, what the savings are here. Um, because I think probably GE could be one of your largest clients in water savings, I would imagine. When, when I think about the answer to that, I, I, that question, three enablers for me are technology, um, the economics, uh, the, the finance side of it, if you will, and then policy, in that order, as far as uh, easier. Uh, and why a company like GE would invest you know, $10 billion a year in, in research and this $200 million fund and stuff is that we absolutely believe that technological advances will not only help solve this problem, but are going to enable us to sell our stuff. You know, so as we, we're believers in green is green, you know, more efficient technologies, lower cost, lower energy, all of those things are desirable in, in, in the marketplace. So that, that the, the biggie is, is pushing that, um, that lever forward. Uh, the other thing, to your, your, your point about intersection of water and energy, one thing we are seeing, a positive, actually in here in Washington, we've got to have something positive here. Yes, sir. Um, we're, we're working with uh, both the House and Senate and actually moving through, uh, looks like it could be by the end of this year, a 30% investment tax credit for industry to invest in water reuse equipment, so in order to get a break on their, their capital investment. And what it does is moves that return on investment forward a bit. You take a seven-year depreciation, pull that to year one, and you're able to really get that extra, uh, that that. Uh, energy to move it up the priority list for an industrial customer. So it, it's it's interesting is it's it's coming through with the energy bill. It's actually moving through Senate and House in a couple of different ways, but it's very much tied to energy. And the customer would not get that benefit if it isn't an energy less energy intensive solution. So so we're tying finally starting to see the tie between energy and water. Unfortunately, there just isn't enough of that. But if we think of these as systems as systems, I think it's going to change our behavior. Okay, some other questions out there. Christian, right here in the, um, you need a mic. When, when, oh, oh someone's mic. Okay, good. You nabbed it. Good job. I'll pass it on as soon as I'm done. All right. My name is Franca Brilliant, and I'm with the National Environmental Education Foundation. We're a nonprofit organization that specializes in lifelong environmental literacy. And my question builds on what Jeff was saying about visibility of data. Um, we have a program every year, about a week, that focuses on environmental education resources. We just put them out into the general public. Last year, our theme was actually water and energy and the connection. Oh, and let me tell you, there's a lot out on water. There's a lot out on energy, almost nothing on the two. We actually had to build new curricular materials. So I wonder if you could address, one, what's going out to the general public on this nexus, and two, even more specifically, if you're trying to feed information into the educational system so that the next generation is really prepared for this challenge. Thanks. Did you plant that question, Carl? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you just said, there's, there's very little going out to the public about this intersection and this collision. Um, in our research, w we, we had, you know, reporters and correspondents dispatched to various places where these chokes points are emerging, which we explored. Um, there's a lot of looking at this um, through academia. Um, NGOs are looking at this pretty significantly, NRDC, WRI, who else are important important think tanks that are looking at this um, but there isn't this is this what we've done with choke point us if it's not the first time it's one of the first times that a news organization or anybody has put a narrative together that you know reaches some stark and startling conclusions so far i mean the story that we're telling is as you you know it's not a happy story um, we will get to the solutions pieces we will get to the research pieces as we move forward um, why that's happening, i give you one thought, and that is that, and this is just a media piece, the, the national media, the media's, the mainstream media's ability to grapple with this kind of complexity um, has diminished so significantly, with the exception of a few important news organizations. One of them is one that I continue to write for at the New York Times, and on Friday I'm going to talk to the national editors to say, look, this is a time story. Let's partner on, on, on getting it out there. But in, in when I was at the New York Times, these are the kinds of stories we used to pursue, these very large structural stories. And then when I began my talk, I said that this was one of the biggest stories of my career. The last time I've done anything as a journalist that was this much of a breaking story with these kinds of dimensions, with the significant implications, was 
20 some odd years ago when I led a team of reporters that looked at the nuclear weapons industry in the United States and looked at the deteriorating conditions, health and environmental and, and, and you know, made that such a, a huge issue. It became an uh, issue in the Dukakis Bush campaign of 1988. Um, this story will get there. I mean, what you heard today, you will hear. It will it, journalism. This kind of information will percolate up. There's a percolation process, and it will, you will begin to hear more about it. But you're not going to hear about it in the places that really matter in the policy making arena. You know, it's not going to be on this week. You know, it's not going to be on CNN until something awful happens and they get to it. But it will be in the in the in the print media. It will be online. And we'll see it percolate up through GRIST, through through um, some of the other online environmental organizations, some of the really good online news organizations. So in terms of media, I think you'll be able to do that. The rest of it, I... On the on the data side, though, it's, it's an incredibly exciting time. I mean, just two <laughs> or three years ago, we wouldn't have been able to suck this much stuff into the Google or do a risk assessment. Um, I mean, you have organizations like the World Economic Forum that are pulling together their different councils um, in agriculture and water and energy to look at this. They're pulling together their data people. Um, the tools are out there. And to get the kids involved, there are things like uh, World Water Monitoring Day. And we have the ability in the next year or two for all the remote sensing that we can do. And like you were saying, a smart home. Mom, Dad, we're at, we're at threat level caution. We have to get <laughs> back to green or blue on our water use. Um, and this is all coming down the pike, and I think the kids can not only participate in it, they can, they can demand it. One thing we're doing at the university level, and, and it's, it's not enough, but it's a start. Um, in fact, we have 60 universities coming into our uh, training center week from Monday uh, to, to look at doing multiple things on the campus. We're pulling together the, the softer disciplines of the finance and, and social economic parts of the university with the hard sciences of engineering at the campus and doing treasure hunts, we're looking at the interplay between energy and water at the campus level. So for instance, uh, I was at Ohio State recently and Dean Poon of the Fisher School, the business school, coming together with the Dean of the Engineering School to rethink how do they go out, out across the Ohio State's campus. Emory and Georgia Tech are coming together in Atlanta very similarly. Uh, Wharton and Penn. You know, so we're looking at how do you pull these universities, even within the university, they're creating new curriculum. They're looking at, uh, the, as we tie the, the the business and finance majors in with the engineers, it creates a whole different discussion. And they do start understanding what are those trade-offs, what are the plays. So I think we're going to, I mean, already that my, I have a 21-year-old, uh, my, my daughter's a senior at Penn State, and her behaviors, her thoughts, her and, and the circle of friends she runs with, completely different than uh, my motivations when I was coming out of college, which was where can I make the most money? I mean, that's not what they're about. And it, it, I have great hope in this generation. And I think by doing some university level work like that, and we've got to continue to drive it down. I'd love to take a fund and put it into the high, junior high and high school science fairs. Let's do a science fair around the water energy nexus piece. Fund that and really raise the visibility. Make them as, uh, as popular as the Football as a quarterback, right? There you go. Anyway, go okay. geeks. Okay, go. okay, Cushing. We've got some. More. We've we, this side of the room. You've had enough questions. We're moving over here. Uh, yeah, just gentlemen right there, and and let's keep them succinct again. You guys are doing a good job. Um, choice question. You've indicated. Who are you? I'm sorry. My name is James Sang. I'm retired. Uh, you've indicated <laughs> that there are lots of different kinds of water, especially after reuse. On the demand side, uh, do we have a feel, looking downstream, how the different kinds of users, what kind of qualities they require? I assume the fracker doesn't need very good water, and the farmer may not need super pure. So do we I, I, have that access and to do the optimization? We do have a, a, a great handle on that. The problem is there aren't always alternate sources of water available. Way too often we see high-quality water being used for low-quality uses. I was at a paper mill recently, and they're using great municipal water that was pumped from about 20 miles away, purified and pumped, and they're using it you know, with big red hoses to wash the floor. And so there's still a disconnect between the quality needed and the, and the, the application. But you take something like frac water, it does actually need a pretty high quality water to avoid um, basically fouling this well that's, that's two miles below the, the, the surface. So you can't just take that low grade discharge water and take it right back to the intake. So, but, but to your point, it's this ability to match up the right source water with the right use. 
today there aren't a lot of choices of source, uh, and we need to rethink that so that we do match that up. Let's use, you know, water re municipal water reuse, fantastic for irrigation, you know, but yet today we have policy that doesn't allow it because policy is based on, you know, 70-year-old you know, te technology. So great point, and I think we have to continue to, to challenge that and, and move it. Okay. Um Someone hijacked the mic. Good. I like an initiative out there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Christopher Krause. Uh, I actually work with Veronica at the National Environmental Education Foundation. Um, Jeff, you mentioned the, uh, the 6 to 19 percent of a city's energy demand is used to uh, produce, treat, and transport water. I'm just kind of curious, what are the, what are the variables that, that's, that make the difference between a city that uses 6 percent of its water versus 19 percent of its water? Um, and then maybe if you could highlight, you know, like the the, the, the best and worst examples of yeah, cities? Sim simple is the length of the pipe. I mean, okay. most of that, that energy consumption is in the pumping cost to move water around. So in California, I mentioned, you know, that's a lot of movement of water from the north to the south. Uh, so so on, this, on the state level, just huge uh, uh, quantity of water there. Uh, again, there is a trade-off as you go to higher technologies. Often that does require higher pressures to pump. And so, you know, we, we have to be cautious about as we move to different technologies. But by far, the number one consumer of energy, well, by far, but it, in many uh, metropolitan areas with a lot of land area covered, it's the pumping costs. And that's, that's that range that you see. And different cities, you know, I was in Stanford, Connecticut recently, their, their energy costs are at 20, 22 cents per kilowatt versus, you know, in the southeast, it's five cents. So the behavior around that energy cost is different also. You know, Stanford's much more motivated to try to reduce that consumption, be smart, they're looking at waste of energy, all kind of creative of, uh, activities in order to, uh, to reduce their energy impact. So and The other piece of that, too, is efficiency, because what Mexico City loses 40 to 60 percent of its water exactly just through right. cracks in the pipes. Um, and so, so efficiency and then even, even the types of materials they use for the piping yeah. um, for the hydro uh, yeah, hydroflow. To that, to that point, it's interesting. Another the issue that municipalities are dealing with is I think the number is around 44% now is considered non-revenue water a across uh, the U.S. So in other words, 44% of the water produced they never get paid for. Part of that is due to leaks, 20-some-odd percent on average, ranging from probably you know the 5 to 8% at the absolute best case to 60% water loss. But a lot of that is, you know, being tapped uh, or unmetered water or, you know, there's all these reasons why they're not generating revenues. So part of that is let's you know, be smart about the water you're making, be, you know, wise from energy, but also get paid for it. So, Thanks. Okay. Some other hands up. I guess the other side of the room dominates again. Uh, Jeff Erickson with Sustainability. A very quick question. You talked about the need for appropriate water pricing. Are there good examples that exist out there? Yes. <laughs> Such as? And what were they? Where, where would they be? He was trying to be succinct on his yeah, answer. Now you can elaborate. Answer. No, uh, there are. Uh, I, I don't have the great examples to share with you right now, but there are. There, there's both in the U.S. and, and non-domestically. Western Europe has been very wise about kind of decoupling this volume from, from the price. Uh, and, and what we're seeing is w one of the challenges is, you know, if I use 20 percent less water and my bill stays the same, you, we have to be careful about the motivation. So what a lot of, of some of the, the more progressive communities are doing is providing other services to make up for that gap. So it might be, uh, you know, choice in the water quality that you get. It's the uh, monitoring and metering and, you know, provide you that additional information to be wise about it. it you know, there, we got to look at what other services potentially could a water provider bring to the table that makes up for this, you know, for, for the re re reductions. But, but just the, the decoupling is a big deal and or penalties, the price goes up for volume versus goes down based on a baseline. You know, so there's, uh, there are smarter behaviors out there and apologies, don't have, I don't know if you guys came across some really as you traveled around the world? We, we have a reporter on our staff based in Seattle named Brett Walton, who has, who's very interested in these kinds of, of data stories about how um, pricing of water, how cities compare one with the other, how it affects uh, use and withdrawals. And I suggest, you know, going on the Circle Blue site and just typing his name into the, and with those numbers. And it, he's done tremendous work, beginning to do tremendous work on this. The other thing I want to say about the, water municipalities, what we, there's an interesting story we haven't yet done about how municipal water systems have become very important in the planning for
for their communities. So Grand Rapids in our home state used its, its municipal water system and to actually limit growth on its edges, causing some friction between the outer suburbs who had wanted to tap in, but actually using it as a growth boundary. And in South Dakota, um, where Hyperion is proposing to build a $12 billion refinery, the first in the United States in, since the late 1970s, the, the municipal water system that they had asked to provide the 12 million gallons of day, water a day to, to run that plant said no in August, I think, just this summer. It's a striking, very striking finding. I mean, the, whether they build that plant or not, but for a municipal water system to stand up in front of a $12 billion industrial infrastructure project that would employ thousands to build it and hundreds to manage it, that's a really, really powerful signal, at least on the upper, you know, the northern Great Plains, that they're not to be trifled with about this. And that may be one of the important hopes we have about how to manage this in a way that it just doesn't run out of control. Okay. Oh, we, oh yeah. and I have a mic here. The left side of the room to me is taking over. Uh, I'm Steve Solomon. I'm the uh, author of a book uh, called Water uh, that recently came out. Uh, I have a question really for, uh, for the gentleman from General Electric uh, on the water accounting uh, at General Electric, because as you point out, more and more of the fortune uh, companies are starting to uh, try to evaluate mm -hmm. both how to, how to value water and uh, how to look at it through their chain and through the various matrices of, of, of uses uh, that it might uh, uh, inter interact with. Uh, you being one of the leaders in this field, how do you guys do it? And why not make the model that, uh, how, how good are you at making the model that others might be able to use? Well, in fact, we're, we're just now getting from turning it from internal to external because we, it wasn't easy. Uh, the GE sites are some of the hard, the toughest customers we have. You know, it's got to be a payback there too. We're, we're very tough on costs. So what we did, we, we have this process, we've, it sounds kind of hokey, but it's referred to as treasure hunt. And it started in our energy business, now it includes our water business. So you take a building like we're in here. We'll, we'll bring a, a cross-functional group together, our lighting group, energy, motors, water, everybody comes together with a whole group of the local team. So it would be whoever's running the Wilson Center, let's say, or, or actually the broader, I guess, the Reagan building. We would come in on midday on a Sunday and stay through Tuesday. You watch a couple of cycles of a, of a building, for instance, coming up and down. And you look at all of the waste, all of the energy. You, you just, you're hunting for the gold that's out there. So, you know, it's everything from, all right, we got CFLs. You know, everything from incandescents to inefficient motors to, to <laughs> heating systems to, you know, non-motion sensing, all these various things. And from a water perspective, we look at inefficient chiller systems. You know, that, that's just, you know, a small scale in a commercial building. But, you know, ramp that out to a broader industrial building. Uh, and for, uh, one of the biggest challenges we have is exactly what we've been talking about, is our plants look at water as free. One of the largest consumers of water in the General Electric Company is actually one of the power and water uh, facilities and uh, is, is the number one water consumer. And the water is essentially free river water to the tune of uh, over a billion gallons a year. And so my challenge <laughs> and, uh, was to get them to realize it's not free. So as we did this treasure hunt, we started really investigating to find that uh, this, they were using, these are huge pumps, 30,000 gallon a minute uh, massive old cast iron pumps, <laughs> energy hogs. I mean, you watch the, you know, the electric meter twirl, the power plant goes on when this baby runs. And uh, <laughs> what they were using it, bypassing the water off, and they would just run this system and not even need the water. It was, it was kind of a testing process, so the water was in and out. Again, the water was, quote, free coming from the local river. But we start taking into account the 17 people that manage the system, the energy costs associated. You know, you start pulling the lens back. It was over a million dollars a year they were spending on this one part of the water system. So part of it is we have to look holistically at what does that water really cost and, and put a value on it. So uh, through the last five years, we, we initiated decomagination in 2005. And now, you know, here we are five years later, we've done a lot to reduce our own consumption. I mean, the benefit is for us, we're, we cut our energy bill by $150 million a year within General Electric. And we've cut our water consumption by well in excess of 3 billion gallons a year. So, I mean, we're making an impact, and it drops to the bottom line. So it is paying for itself, absolutely. So what we're down, doing now is turning this process outward and taking it to our customers to be able to say, let's do these treasure hunts. Let's, let's Pareto this the opportunity out and go find these nuggets of savings. that are. And a lot of them are literally low-hanging fruit. I mean, it has nothing to do with buying something. It's just wise, you know, smarter ways that you're operating your system. In this case, a lot of that, that pump I was mentioning was just – not only replacing it with more efficient pump, but just smarter operations. So those are the kind of things that we're doing in order to kind of 
externalize what we've done internally. And and did you do this? Was this not just was this globally? Yeah, including absolutely. all your operations in yeah, China. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, a lot of the focus is is outside the U.S. on a lot of the opportunity. We have, you know, a lot of the facilities are here, but certainly a lot of the need is in the water scarce and energy scarce regions of the world. Okay. What well, just da, I need a microphone. And, and a follow-up with the, the next logical step is then, to what degree, though, do you take that and then look at the sustainable supply coming from the environment? The other, obviously, there are competing res, uh, competing uses uh, as well, and uh, and and then do the same thing through the supply chain eventually. In our own supply chain? Well, well first looking at, at the sustainability of the local supply of, of water itself, and then worry about your supply chain uh, as well, because you're a transnational company. Absolutely. In, in every one of these situations, we kind of, I think about it as the kind of the one-inch red binder on the shelf that's the what-if you know, book, where even if you're not in a problem today, what happens if either your water price doubles? What happens if your water source that you rely on today is gone tomorrow? So it's a... It's the, the next alternative. It's scenario planning, and it's at its best. So we do a lot of modeling and scenario planning to if I go from this, you know, uh, uh, pristine well water to gray water reuse, what's the downstream impacts of that? And so it's a lot of modeling and scenario planning to determine so that you're prepared. A lot of it is even if I can't convince them today to make a change, if a change occurs tomorrow, they're ready. So it, you know, a lot of it is just behavioral shift. And uh, to your point, it's really taken into account what's going on in that local watershed, in that, that broader uh, environment. Okay. Hey, you guys. Do you think they like the topic? <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope am so, so excited. I mean, I, I'm so excited because I got, I'm, I'm actually more of a water person, China water. But as, you know, in, in my work and in, over the years here at the Wilson Center, every now and then, like I had uh, Pacific Institute's, uh, one of their chaps, Gary Wolf, I took him to China where I had him give a talk at the Shanghai Environmental Protection Bureau about what California was doing. You know, they did an assessment of uh, waste not, want not, looking at just how much energy water uses. And you don't, normally don't see Chinese Environmental Protection Bureau officials getting excited. They were very excited. And, and, and every time I, I have this kind of water energy nexus talk, bring this, try to create this conversation. Again, it's been very ad hoc. You know, it's kind of like you need to have the grants to do this stuff fully, but I've got some now, right? Um, the excitement and the hunger for that is there in China. And, uh, and so I will be, okay, I will be doing more meetings on this. There will be a, a more heavier China one. I'm looking there at my WRI colleague. I, I, I helped with the water risk assessment tool. <laughs> I got some smart Chinese water folks who had never really actually thought about this issue got kind of excited themselves. And um, so, yeah, so w I'll be able to pull you, you guys in here to come and give a talk on that. Just thinking now just about U.S.-China energy cooperation, just a little side note to whet your appetite. You do know in some of the nine agreements that the, in the Obama-Who agreements last November, there is a shale gas cooperation component to it. I will say no more. Not, you know, but it just, it's, it's a question to me. Because first of all, when I first heard it, I have to admit, I'd say, what's shale gas? You know, that's been, a lot of NGO folks came to me, same thing. So um, there is more to come. I, uh, yeah. One, one, just one point, and that is, I don't know how many people are in the room here. We got about almost seven. We got some disciples here. Okay, every, <laughs> don't leave it up to us. Don't leave it up to Circle of Blue. And uh, y'all know a little bit more when you left here today than you did a few hours ago. Take those facts and those nuggets. Tweet them if you tweet. Put them on your whatever your. I think this is also a wonderful opportunity for our communities, our extended communities, using the digital community to get this word out there. Uh, there's enough garbage going out on those uh, various channels. So use your channel, whatever that is. It's a cocktail party uh, this Friday, whatever that might be. It's going to take this groundswell effort. What's it mean to you personally? Because I think th that's what I love about what you guys are. It's the stories. It's the passion that gets behind it. It's not data and charts from, you know, from me. So tell the story. And uh, H2O sustain is my uh, tweet if you uh, want to see my <laughs> tweets uh, for those that are uh, Twitterites. Uh, but anyway, d get the word out there. I just think that's another way this is going to move. I, I, I did an a interview with... Uh, um, remember which it was, a couple of weeks ago, an online interview, and uh, I, I was reading the comments. There was like 100 comments, and 90% of them were, uh, oh, it's big GE trying to put the hammer down. They want to run the world, blah, blah, blah. Water's not an issue. I can leave my tap on, you know, every, you know, 24-7, and I never run out of water. There's just this, uh, this lack of knowledge out there, and it's very frustrating. So help tell the story because uh, we can't wait for a catastrophe. Yeah, and help us tell the story, too. Yeah. Um, and let us know what stories need to be told. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a big or the big story. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so, so let us know. Let us know where we need to be looking. And 
all the pieces are there, and we'll take that orbital perspective. Yeah. Okay, um, can we applaud these guys? Yeah. Ooh, that's a lot of applause. And um, and if you, not water, but the China Environment Forum, we have we are in a meeting marathon next month for all you China focused folks. Next Friday, we're having a talk on uh, looking at MRV issues, U.S. China low carb low carbon pathways in both countries. We also have um, uh, U.S. China cooperation in the power sector. I have Secretary Luck cruising by and by with uh, Duke Energy folks, and uh, and also we have a later in the month on the nineteenth uh, on glacier melt in China and. Um, also, a d different meeting, but on uh, China's ecological impact on Southeast Asia. So if any of you are not in the China Environment Forum Mafia and want to be, come give us your cards. And again, thank you. I want to thank you guys for being so attentive. And no one appeared to be doing their texting. So I, I want to thank you for that. Tweeting, okay, maybe. No